The Enlightenment, which we talked about in the last chapter, encouraged a gradual shift from an understanding of political sovereignty as a gift of God, that we call the divine right of kings, which was expressed by absolute monarchs like Louis XIV, to ideas of popular sovereignty and government by consent of the governed, or through a social contract between rulers and people. The Enlightenment, you'll recall, blossomed when people discovered new knowledge through both exploration and science, and began throwing off what they considered the superstitions of an earlier age, including the idea of the divine right of kings. Philosophers like John Locke and Jean-Jacques Rousseau began reimagining the relationship between individuals and society, while popular writers like Thomas Paine began translating these ideas into pamphlets like Common Sense and into books like The Rights of Man and The Age of Reason that were read not only by other philosophers, but also by hundreds of thousands of regular literate people. Some of the first places that these Enlightenment political ideas were tested were in Britain's 13 North American colonies. The Seven Years or French and Indian War from 1756 to 1763 had been an expensive drain on Britain's treasury, and Parliament believed that the American colonists ought to pay their fair share of the cost of their defense. Britain instituted a number of taxes, including the Sugar Act of 1764, the Stamp Act of 1765, the Townsend Act of 1767, and the Tea Act of 1773. Boycotts and protests by the colonists soon began, including the famous Boston Tea Party, during which enraged patriots boarded a British cargo ship and dumped tea from India into Boston Harbor, rather than to pay the hated new tax. Although the colonists found these taxes oppressive and obnoxious, to a great extent they were luxury taxes or excise taxes on trade rather than direct taxes on personal income or property. Still, imposing new taxes on the colonists was a miscalculation by Parliament because the merchants and the wealthy who were most affected by these taxes had the means and had the motivation to organize a resistance movement. American colonists also objected to the Quartering Act of 1765 that forced them to provide housing and food for British troops. Again, this may have seemed fair to the legislators back in London who had sent an army to defend the colonies against the French and the Indians in this recently concluded war. But it was a big expense for the Americans, and it was an issue that cut across class boundaries more than the luxury taxes and helped to unify the opposition. Another major cause of American resentment against the British after the Seven Years' War was the Royal Proclamation of 1763 that established a western boundary to the colonies roughly along the ridgeline of the Appalachian Mountains. The support that Britain had received from Native Americans who lived in this trans-Appalachian region had been critically important to their winning the war in North America. Tribes such as the Haudenosaunee, which we know as the Iroquois Confederacy, were powerful allies. And their leaders complained about the increasing numbers of settlers that were leaving the coastal colonies to make farms in places like upstate New York and western Pennsylvania and even the Ohio River Valley. The British created an Indian reserve beyond the Appalachians, including western Virginia and Pennsylvania west of Pittsburgh, which had been a French fort but had been captured by the British in the war. This angered both colonists who had looked west for new lands to settle and believed that that had been the point of the war, and also land speculators who had planned on getting rich, buying and selling this western territory. We sometimes forget that in addition to the famous all men created equal and consent of the governed parts of the colonists' declaration of independence, The 1776 document also included a laundry list of complaints against the British crown, including the charge that the king had, quote, endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages whose known rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. The founders understood that independence would mean taking land from these so-called savages. Although the Declaration of Independence echoed the Enlightenment ideals of contractual government and representation, at the time these ideals only applied to white male landowners. Many 
natives sided with Britain in the American Revolution because they saw a British victory as their only hope to prevent the colonists from completely overrunning them. Many slaves also ran away to join British forces, especially after they were offered immediate emancipation by Lord Dunmore. Many fought their former owners or secretly sided with the British against colonial slaveholders. Nor did the Declaration speak for all white colonists, we should note. New York City was occupied by the British until 1783, well after the end of the fighting, and the city was a haven for royalists, supporters of British rule. And the city was a haven for loyalists, supporters of British rule. Historians have estimated the number of loyalists at 15 to 20 percent of the total colonial population or about 400,000 people. Most of these loyalists did stay and become U.S. citizens after the war, but actually about 70,000 left for other parts of the British Empire. Many of those in the north went to Canada and settled in New Brunswick, while southerners went to Florida, which had remained loyal under British rule, or to the British islands in the Caribbean. And after the revolution, many poor Americans were often left wondering what they had actually fought for. Taxes were high and farmers couldn't pay them because the continental currency printed by the rebel government to pay the troops was worthless. Western Massachusetts farmers who felt that the new government in Boston did not represent them revolted in 1786 in an event called Shays Rebellion, which was put down by government troops. This fight and others forced leaders of the Confederated States to reconsider how a federal government ought to be organized, and they called a constitutional convention to meet in Philadelphia with the 13 states sending representatives. The United States Constitution that formed the new government began with the words, we the people. It acknowledged the Enlightenment concept that political power comes from the consent of the governed. The final document was influenced by the framers' studies of earlier republics and by negotiations over the various state constitutions that had favored the idea of three branches of government, a legislative, executive, and judicial, along with a system of checks and balances that made no one branch superior to the others. In spite of all of these checks and balances, when the convention sent the newly drafted U.S. Constitution to all the states for ratification, Many New England towns either rejected the document outright or provisionally approved it with modifications that they sent back to the authorities. In most cases, these provisional approvals were simply marked as yes votes and the carefully worked out modifications were filed. But dissatisfaction with the original constitution was so strong in spite of a series of promotional articles published about it that have become known as the Federalist Papers that the convention was forced to write the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, and issue them at the same time. Without the Bill of Rights, the US Constitution would be a much different document. So before we continue, a couple more questions for discussion. Why did the British consider the taxes that they imposed on the colonists reasonable? Secondly, why did Indians and blacks side with the British during the revolution? And then finally, what prompted the writing of the Bill of Rights?